Okay, I guess we should get started then. Uh, so anyway, welcome to the first uh, Baumic lecture of the year. I'm happy to say that we're, uh, we've joined forces with our friends at IPAM to, uh, to host this. And tomorrow there'll be a second lecture from Edward Witten uh, at 2 p.m., I think exactly right here. So please come again. Um, so uh, Edward Witten has been a dominant force in theoretical physics for the last 30 years or so. Uh, he's contributed to many, many topics uh, uh, in string theory, in, in uh, supersymmetric, supersymmetric field theory, Chern Simons theory, uh, and, and of course, uh, knot theory. Uh, and uh, uh, he's won uh, just about every award you could win. Uh, so there's the MacArthur Genius Award. Uh, there's, there's the uh, uh, National Medal of Science. From, he got it from George W. Bush. The Lorentz Medal, Isaac Newton Medal, Fundamental Physics Prize, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and I think everybody here knows that he's, in fact, the only physicist who has ever won the Fields Medal. So without further ado, I give you Edward Witten, who's going to tell us about integrability from four dimensions. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, I'd like to thank IPAM and the Baumec Institute for the invitation to give this lecture. So, uh, well, I'll be telling you about a subject that I think is fun, and I hope you'll enjoy it, too. So, uh, most problems in many body physics can't be solved in any kind of closed form. If you've got a single particle in a central force, you can solve that. And then with two particles, you struggle a bit. And of course, with many particles, anything approaching an exact solution is ordinarily way out of reach. But surprising, there's a surprisingly rich story of soluble or integrable models of many body physics in one plus one or two dimensions. So one plus one would mean one space dimension and also time. For example, a quantum chain of interacting particles. And two dimensions here would usually mean classical statistical mechanics in two dimensions. So the prototype are Hans Bethe's ferromagnetic chain in one plus one dimensions in the early days of quantum mechanics. And then Amsager's solution of the Ising model of two dimensional classical statistical mechanics. Now, the soluble models are certainly very special, but surprisingly often they've given important lessons with much wider applicability. For example, the Ising model alone was first important in understanding that equilibrium statistical mechanics can describe second order phase transitions. And then later it was important in understanding the operator product expansion of field theory. And just the Ising model, I've mentioned two, but certainly over its history, there have been more general lessons drawn from it. So integrable systems are surprisingly rich and surprisingly illuminating, even though they're so special. And there have been lots of surprising discoveries in this field since the days of Beta and Amsager. It's hopeless to give a complete list of important contributions, but just a handful of the most important contributions would be by the mathematicians and physicists I've mentioned here. Now, <clears throat> apart from any application, to me, perhaps the most fundamental question about these models is why they exist. Whenever you find an integrable system, the conditions that have to be obeyed in order for it to be integrable, are highly overdetermined, yet they magically hang together. They hang together miraculously, even though the conditions are overdetermined. So a very fundamental question is why all this happens. Now, of course, there are many points of view on a question such as this. But I'll be describing a point of view that I think is especially fascinating and appealing, which is due to Kevin Costello. I'll be describing an approach introduced by Kevin Costello by now about four years ago, and further extended by Costello, Yamazaki, and me in more recent work. But I want to start with a little bit of an introduction to integrable systems. So in this introduction, one goal is to explain how a common framework underlies seemingly completely different kinds of integrable systems. So I'm going to start with uh, 
scattering of particles in one space, one time dimension. So this is meant to be a space-time picture. Time runs vertically and space runs horizontally. And a particle moving with constant velocity is depicted by a straight line with a slope that depends on its velocity. Here I have scattering of two particles, elastic scattering. <clears throat> now, uh, because of energy momentum conservation, the outgoing particles have the same slope as the incoming particles. Of course, that allows time delays in the scattering. So the outgoing lines should be parallel to the incoming lines, but displaced inward because of a delay that occurs in the scattering. I haven't tried to draw those delays, which won't be important in this lecture, but you should imagine them in all my pictures. The reason they won't be important is that we'll consider phenomena that might be happening very far apart in space-time, but the delays are microscopic. They're of order 1 over m, or h bar over mc, where m is the smallest mass in the theory. Now, in a typical relativistic field theory, there are particle production processes, and that's a large part of what makes quantum field theory interesting. So here's a picture of two particles going to three. I've shown the three as if they all emanate from a common point where the two met. But that's only correct up to errors of order of the time delays that we just agreed we were going to overlook. But macroscopically, two go in and then three go out from the same point in space-time. So the symmetries of typical relativistic field theories allow such processes, and they happen all the time. For instance, when you turn on a light bulb and photons are created. However, in two space-time dimensions, there are integral field theories that have extra symmetries. And these extra symmetries move a particle in space by an amount that depends on its velocity. And then particle creation is not possible. So here's a process with two going to three. And now I'll apply a symmetry that will move a particle in space by an amount that depends on its velocity, which means its slope in the picture. So the outgoing particles, I've replaced them with parallel lines that are displaced from the originals by amounts depending on the slope. And these three parallel lines would not meet at a common point in space. So the process isn't possible. Since several generic lines in the plane do not intersect, a theory in which you can have a symmetry that moves a particle by an amount depending on its velocity will not have particle creation. Now, two-particle scattering does happen in even integral systems because any two generic two lines in the plane do intersect. So I've drawn two lines and I've displaced them parallel to themselves and they still intersect. So there's no problem with two-particle scattering. Now, how do we characterize a particle? Well, a particle has a velocity but in relativistic terms, it's better to speak of the rapidity theta. So the energy and momentum are the mass times cosh theta and sinh theta. If you're not familiar with that, just think of theta as the velocity, which it is in the non-relativistic limit. Scattering of two particles with rapidities theta 1 and theta 2 depends only on the rapidity difference theta. So. <clears throat> So again, the slope depends on the velocity, which now means it depends on the rapidity. But the amplitude to scatter two particles of given rapidities will not in general depend only on the rapidity difference, because there may be several different types of particles of the same mass. Now, an obvious reason this might happen, not in general the only reason, but an obvious reason, is that the theory might have a symmetry group G and the particles may be in some irreducible representation of G that I'll call rho. Then the picture looks more like this. Particles of type I and J come in, particles of type K and L go out. Where I, J, K, and L you can think of as basis vectors inside the representation rho. For example, if the group is SU2 and the representation is two-dimensional, then I and J refer to a particle being up or down in the two-dimensional representation of SU2. In general, I, J, K, and L are basis vectors in the representation. And I'll write R, I, J, K, L of theta for the quantum mechanical amplitude for this process. It's usually called an integrable systems theory, the R matrix, although 
in the rest of relativistic field theory is the S matrix. There's actually a, a subtle difference which I'm eliding, which is that the two differ by a scalar factor that won't be important in this lecture. Now, the real fun comes when we consider three particles in the initial and final state. Since we can move them relative to each other by symmetries, keeping fixed the slopes or rapidities, we can assume there are only pairwise collisions. But there are, only, there are two ways to move three lines parallel to themselves in such a way that they only meet pairwise. We could arrange for this configuration or this one. And they must give equivalent results in an integrable theory because there will be a symmetry that transforms one picture into the other. Now, either way, the three collisions occur far apart in space-time, or we can apply a symmetry until they do apply, occur far apart in space-time. And therefore, either way, a three-going-to-three three process is a product of three successive two-going-to-two two processes. But the two-going-to-two two processes occur in a different order in time in the two pictures. So the fact that they're equal leads to the celebrated Yang-Baxter equation, which in terms of pictures says like so. So i, j, and k come in, l, m, and o go out. But the internal particles are in any possible states. Quantum mechanically, you sum over intermediate states. So on the left, you sum over q, r, and s. On the right, you sum over u, t, and v. It's often schematically written like so. Uh, if you write out this equation uh, with all the indices indicated, you'll get quite a mess. So I won't actually do that. But the Yang-Baxter equation says that three successive two-body collisions occurring in this sequence or in this sequence give equivalent results. Now, I'd like to give an example of a solution of the Yang-Baxter equation just to make it concrete that there's something real we're talking about. So the example is for the case that the group is the orthogonal group, OK or SOK, and rho is the k-dimensional representation. And the integrable model is either of two models that are much studied. The gross Navier model or a sigma model whose target is a sphere. And these models are much studied, both for relativistic quantum field theory and also for condensed matter physics. Anyway, the R matrix is uh, what I've indicated here, where the picture means the following. So I, J, K, and L are basis vectors in the uh, vector representation. And group theory tells you that initial and final indices will have to be equal pairwise. So the only possible invariants are delta IL, delta KJ, or delta IK, and so on. A chronic delta is another word. So a line connecting two indices means that they're equal by a chronic delta. And there are three ways to do that. And the R matrix is a sum of the three possible group theory invariants multiplied by three very simple rational functions of the rapidity difference theta. If someone tells you this is a solution of the Yang-Baxter equation, you can check it in 10 minutes. It's not a big calculation. But it's a little bit mysterious because the number of conditions you have to s satisfy is definitely more than the number of arbitrary functions that were at your disposal. That's what I meant at the beginning when I said that a mystery of the subject is why it exists. Now, there are three traditional classes of solutions of the Yang-Baxter equation, depending on when R of, whether R of theta is a rational trigonometric or elliptic function of theta. So looking back here, we see that I gave an example of a rational solution of Yang-Baxter. So the rational and trigonometric solutions exist for all simple E groups and lots of representations. The elliptic ones are only for SLN or SUN. Curiously, although the solutions are associated with the Lie group G, only the rational solutions have G symmetry. Uh, sorry, I wrote an example of a rational solution and I assumed G symmetry when I explained why I took the form it did. But I should warn you, that although the solutions are associated with groups, only one of the three classes of solutions does have the symmetry of the group. The trigonometric solutions have the symmetry of the maximal torus, and the elliptic solutions, well, they have a discrete symmetry group. I wrote here none at all, but they have a finite symmetry group. 
This always seemed like a mystery to me. Why would you somehow account for the existence of a trigonometric solution of Yang vector by talking about an underlying group if the solution, in fact, does not have the symmetry of that group? So these are some of the strange facts about the subject that ultimately uh, Costello's work provided a new uh, perspective on. The solutions also depend on another parameter, a quantum deformation parameter. But for rational solutions, it can be scaled out. So you didn't see it in the example I gave. Now, I motivated this instruction so far by talking about relativistic scattering. But the same solutions of Yang-Baxter are used for physical models of a completely different sort. So there, are, well, we could go in different directions. But what the direction we will go in involves integrable lattice models of statistical mechanics. And they can be constructed directly from a solution of Yang-Baxter. So I've drawn a lattice in which horizontal and vertical lines are labeled by rapidities. And line segments are related by basis vectors. So I've drawn the picture again. So it's a rather busy picture. So vertical and horizontal lines are labeled by rapidities. I didn't have to, but here I took the vertical rapidities equal. The horizontal ones are different. A line segment is labeled by a basis vector. And a crossing is supposed to be labeled by the appropriate R matrix. And then to define our statistical mechanics model, we compute the partition function by summing over all the labels, with each set of labels being weighted by the product of the appropriate R matrix elements. So in terms of statistical mechanics, there is a spin, a statistical degree of freedom that lives on each link in the lattice. And there is a four-spin interaction at each vertex. Now, to make this an honest model of classical statistical mechanics, you need a, all the R matrix elements in some basis to be positive, which turns out to be doable. It puts a non-trivial non condition, but uh, you can achieve that. And when that happens, you have a model of lattice statistical mechanics with four spin interactions at vertices. And it's integrable. It's solvable because the transfer matrices commute, which means that using the Yang-Baxter equation, <laughs> the horizontal lines can be moved up and down past each other. The reason I took the horizontal lines to have different rapidities is that you have to do that in proving the integrability. Whereas, although you could take vertical lines to have different rapidities, you don't have to. So <clears throat> okay, this four-spin interaction might look a little bit weird. So maybe I'll mention that there is a special case, for instance, if you want to get the Ising model, which has two-spin interactions where the four spin coupling, where the four spins decouple in pairs. So you get a pair of, not, this model can, for example, degenerate to a pair of decoupled Ising models. One, well, each one for every other spin. So half of the spins form one Ising model, and the other half form the other Ising model. So lots and lots of integrable models of lattice statistical mechanics can be put in this framework. Now. So what I've explained is how the solutions of the Yang-Baxter equation occur in two quite different kinds of integrable models. One were the models of integrable many-body scattering in one plus one dimensions. The second was lattice statistical mechanics. And we could go on in that direction, but instead I want to head for our main theme, which is to explain Costello's perspective on why the solutions of this highly overdetermined equation exist. Well, there's another area where one finds something a lot like the Yang-Baxter equation. That's the theory of knots in three dimensions. So when you study a knot theory, well, how do knot theorists study knot theory? Well, a knot can be a horrible tangled mess of strings. And then if you want to know whether two knots are equivalent, you try moving the strands around. And then you have what are called Weidemeister moves, elementary moves where you compare two different knot pictures. And then knot theorists prove that everything can be built out of some elementary moves. So here's one of the, here's the most important Weidemeister move. That as a statement about knots, this picture is equivalent to this one. Because you can go from here to here by moving this vertical strand to the right, in which process it does not intersect the other two. So the two pictures drawn there are topologically equivalent as statements about knots in three dimensions. 
Now, there's an obvious and important resemblance to the Yang-Baxter equation in three dimensions, but there are equally important differences. First of all, in knot theory, one strand passes over or under another, as I've drawn here. Knot theory is a three-dimensional subject. Knots live in three dimensions. Yang-Baxter theory is a purely two-dimensional theory. This picture is completely flat. This is literally, this is a picture that's meant to be happening on a two-dimensional surface, which you could think of as being the screen. The two lines are crossing each other with no notion of over or under. Also, knot theory, in some ways, is a little bit richer than Yang-Baxter. So for example, well, this right of Meister move, well, it's got a cousin in Yang-Baxter, but nothing quite as simple and powerful as that. So these two points refer to structure that's present in knot theory and not in Yang-Baxter theory. Most importantly, that knot theory is three-dimensional. But there's also an important difference in the opposite direction. In Yang-Baxter theory, the spectral parameter is crucial. Sorry, I should tell you that the rapidity theta is called the spectral parameter in Yang-Baxter theory. So the parameter that I called theta until now, but which I'm now going to be calling the spectral parameter, because that's what people call it in most of integrable systems theory. So the spectral parameter is crucial in Yang-Baxter theory, but it has no analog in knot theory. Well, despite these differences, there is an obvious analogy between the Yang-Baxter equation and knot theory, and the first right of Meister move of knot theory. So let's pursue it a little bit. As I've said, the usual solutions of Yang-Baxter depends on the choice of a simple E group G and an irreducible representation rho. They also depend on your decision to do a rational elliptic or trigonometric solution. There are not that depend on the same data. To define them at least formally, we consider a three-dimensional gauge theory with gauge group G. In mathematical language, we let N be a three-manifold, E over M, a G bundle, and A a connection on G. But, sorry, a connection on E, that should have been. Um, but in physical language, A is a gauge field. And then, for a gauge field in three dimensions, one has something rather special, which is the turn simons function. It's a function which is gauge invariant, or at least it's gauge invariant mod 2 pi times an integer, even though it's not manifestly gauge invariant, because it's not written manifest or solely in terms of the Yang-Mills field strength, <coughs> the analog of the electric and magnetic field of ordinary electromagnetism. So this rather special function is a gauge invariant function of the gauge field that has the property that it was written without any use of a metric tensor on the manifold M. So it makes sense purely in the world of differential topology, where M is an oriented three manifold but has no additional structure. I've normalized it so it's gauge invariant mod two pi times an integer. In quantum mechanics, the action has to be well-defined mod two pi times an integer so that the argument of the finding path integral will be single valued. Well, just to remind you about what I mean by the finding path integral, I put in h bar, but I've written the formulas with h bar equals one. So capital I, the action being well-defined mod two pi times an integer, makes the argument of the path integral single valued. So in particular, we can take the action to be any integer times the turn simons function, and that will give a sensible action of a quantum field theory. A quantum field theory with this action is a topological quantum field theory, since there's no metric tensor in sight. Now, for today, let's just take the three manifold to be R3, but we'll let K be a knot embedded in R3. A knot is just a closed circle embedded in R3. So that's an example of a knot. We pick an irreducible representation rho of G, and then we define what in gauge theory is called the Wilson operator, which is the trace in the representation rho of the holonomy of the gauge field around the knot, which physicists usually write this way. But if you're a mathematician, this is what it is. So it's the Wilson loop operator of gauge theory. Physically, the Wilson operator, so physically you might have a 
charged particle in the representation rho. And then perhaps it might have traveled around the path k in space time. And you'd like to compute the quantum amplitude for that to happen. And the quantum amplitude will contain a factor of w rho of k. So physically, the meaning of w rho of k is that it's a piece in computing the amplitude for a quasi-particle to travel around the path k. Then the usual quantum knot invariants of which the prototype is the Jones polynomial are expectation values of the Wilson operator. So that, to be precise, gives the usual quantum knot invariants at a particular value of q. And then if g is SU2 and rho is the spin 1 half representation of SU2, the invariant you get this way is an important knot invariant called the Jones polynomial. In general, you get this way the generalizations of the Jones polynomial for other groups and representations. Now, from the Jones polynomial, you can't extract the usual solutions of Yang-Baxter because there's no spectral parameter in sight. But the two are a close cousin, and for instance, it was shown in the 80s that if you take the trigonometric solution and take theta to I infinity, you essentially get the Jones, well, more or less the Jones polynomial. So there's a special case where they match. They, they depend on the same data, a group and a representation. They match in a special case. And one involves Yang-Baxter and the other involves knot theory, which have the relation, naive relationship I explained before when we compared the writer must remove to the Yang-Baxter equation. So it's tantalizingly close, but there is certainly no cigar. Now, how can we modify or generalize chern simons gauge theory to include the spectral parameter? A naive idea is to replace the finite dimensional gauge group G with its loop group LG. The loop group is just the group of G-valued functions of an angular variable theta. So I'm calling the angular variable theta, which we used for rapidity before, because theta will play the role of the rapidity after a little while. But for now, theta is just an angular variable. It goes from 0 to 2 pi on the circle. And g of theta is a g-valued function of theta. And we can multiply such functions in the obvious way by pointwise multiplication. So we just multiply g of theta times h of theta to get g h of theta. And it's important here that we take the loop. There's a sentence here which is written to avoid. Okay. In a previous iteration of this lecture, I got caused confusion by not writing that sentence. It's important here that we take the loop group and not its central extension, which in some branches of mathematical physics is more commonly studied. The central extension would force us to construct infinite dimensional representations. But the loop group has very simple-minded representations which mathematically are called evaluation representations that live at a particular value of theta. In these representations, a loop g of theta just acts according to its value g of theta naught at some point theta equals theta naught. So if the underlying group was SU2, you have a loop in SU2 g of theta, but its value at theta naught is just an element of SU2, and then that can act in any representation of SU2. Well, we hope that theta naught will be the spectral parameter label carried by a particle in the solution of the Yang-Baxter equation. So what we've done is to just by brute force include the spectral parameter in group theory. And that might seem too trivial, and indeed it is. But let's go on for a while and see where we run into trouble. Taking the gauge group to be a loop group means that the gauge field, which I've written here, now depends also on theta, so we could write it this way. So the components of the gauge field now depend on four variables, the three x's, the three coordinates of space, time, plus theta. But although they depend on four coordinates, it's a three-component gauge field because it's a gauge field in three dimensions for a bigger group. So it's not a full four-dimensional gauge field because there's no d theta term. There's just dx, dy, and dz, or dx1, dx2, and dx3. It's a gauge field in three dimensions 
But it depends also on theta because the gauge grouping can now be promoted to a loop group. So everything depends on theta. The churn simons action has a generalization to this situation where you do the same thing as before, but you also put in a factor of d theta. And the integral is perfectly gauge invariant. So now we've gotten a version of churn simons theory where a representation will depend on a spectral parameter. So are we going to be happy? Well, no. What goes wrong is that since there's no d by d theta term in the action, when we calculate the propagator for the gauge field, we're not going to like what we get. Technically, the kinetic energy is not elliptic, and that will lead to very bad things happening. Because there was no d by d theta term in the action, the propagator has a stupid delta function of theta minus theta prime times what it was in ordinary churn simons theory. And because of that, loop amplitudes will be proportional to delta of zero. So here's a simple one loop Feynman diagram. One vertex is a theta, one is a theta prime. They're connected by two propagators. Each propagator will give a delta of theta minus theta prime, and that's too many delta functions. So we're going to be left with a factor of delta of zero. And that's our punishment for our simple-minded way to try to include the spectral parameter. So what Kevin Costello did was to cure this problem via a very simple deformation. We take our three manifold to be R3, but now I'll call the coordinates x, y, and t. So overall, we have x, y, t, and theta. But now we're going to combine t and theta into a complex variable, which I call z, which is epsilon t plus i theta, where epsilon is a real parameter. The theory will reduce to the bad case that we just described if epsilon is 0. So we have to take epsilon non-zero. But as soon as epsilon isn't zero, its value will not matter because we're allowed to rescale t. The theory before was completely diffeomorphism invariance. So nothing in the rest of the construction would change if we rescale t. And as soon as epsilon isn't zero, we can set it to one by rescaling t. So in the rest of my formulas, epsilon will be one. But I introduced it to explain that we were making an infinitesimal deformation away from the naive theory that didn't work because epsilon could just as well have been 10 to the minus 16. The point is that at epsilon equals 0, the theory is too degenerate and bad things happen. But if you infinitesimally perturb away from the bad case, it doesn't matter how much you perturb. It's a little bit analogous to the following. If you take the group of Galilean relativity, and add some term proportional to 1 over the speed of light. You get a different group, which is the Lorentz group. And you get the same group, no matter how small is 1 over the speed of light. Because the degenerate group, which is the group of Galilean relativity, essentially has only one deformation. And as soon as the deformation parameter is not 0, you get the same thing, which is the Lorentz group. So here, when we deform infinitesimally away from the theory that doesn't work, we get the Costello theory that does work. And it doesn't matter how small the deformation parameter is. So now, in the formulas we had before, we replaced d theta by dz. And now we regard A as a gauge field, a partial gauge field on R3 times S1. S1 is the circle parameterized by theta. But now we'll say it's missing a dz term, while before we said it was missing a d theta term. And now the action is the same as it was before, except we put dz instead of d theta. And uh, where I before had k over 4 pi, I'm calling it 1 over h bar. So we've lost the three-dimensional symmetry of standard churn simons theory because of splitting away one of the three coordinates of R3 and combining it with theta. So we're not going to get knot invariants. But Yang-Baxter theory does not have three-dimensional symmetry. Remember, the Reitermeister move has an over and under, but the Yang-Baxter equation is purely a two-dimensional picture. So by this deformation, we've lost the extra symmetry of knot theory and reduced ourselves only to the symmetry of integral systems, of, of Yang-Baxter theory. We still have two-dimensional topological invariance diffeomorphism symmetry. <coughs> 
But as I told you a moment ago, Yang Vax only has two-dimensional symmetry. So losing the three-dimensional symmetry is what we wanted. So modifying standard turn Simon theory in this fashion turns out to have exactly the right properties to give Yang-Baxter theory instead of knot theory. The three-dimensional diffeomorphism invariance is reduced to two-dimensional diffeomorphisms. But on the other hand, now there's a complex variable z that will turn out to be the spectral parameter. And here I should warn you about one more thing, which I maybe didn't write down. No, I didn't. So when I started the lecture, the spectral parameter was real because it was a velocity in the beginning. But in integrable system theory, it's ultimately important to regard the spectral parameter as a complex variable. And that's what we have here naturally, because z is a complex variable. Now, I've described the action so far on R2 times what you could call C star, where R star is R times a circle, where R times a circle is parameterized by z. And then we use the complex one form, dz. The action is, makes sense a little more generally on a product of a smooth two manifold and a complex Riemann surface C that has a holomorphic one form omega. So this is a slightly more general form of the action with dz replaced by omega. But it turns out that to get a quantum theory, omega should have no zeros. It can have poles, but no zeros. Intuitively, that's because the zero of omega is equivalent to a point at which h bar goes to infinity. And the theory actually breaks down. By contrast, poles of omega cause no problem. They just correspond to weak coupling, points where h bar effectively goes to zero. So C is a complex Riemann surface with a differential that may have poles but no zeros. And there only are three types. The options are either the complex plane, the complex plane divided by integer shifts, which I called C star, or the complex plane divided by rank two lattice that gives a Riemann surface of genus G. And these three cases turn out to correspond to the three traditional classes of solutions of Yang-Baxter, rational, trigonometric, and elliptic. Now, in getting there, the first point is that the theory has a sensible propagator and a sensible perturbation expansion. The basic reason is that the propagator is sensible. Well, the propagator was not sensible before because it had d by dt, but no d by d theta. And d by dt is not an elliptic operator in two dimensions. But now we've replaced d by dt with d by dz bar. And that's an operator that has a sensible inverse. So now the theory has a sensible propagator with no delta functions. And just to underscore that, I've written the propagator explicitly in a particular gauge. So we won't use that formula, but I've just written it down to make you feel assured that now we do have a sensible propagator with no delta functions. And then Costello proves that with this propagator, the perturbative expansion is well-defined. It's a tricky point for the following reason. The theory is actually unnormalizable by power counting. So a priori, you would worry just like in general relativity. But here, there are no possible counterterms because all local gauge invariant operators vanish by the classical equations of motion. Anyway, Costello proves that the theory has a well-defined expansion. So now we consider Wilson operators, that is, holonomy operators, where L is a loop in the product of a two-manifold times a complex Riemann surface. And the complex Riemann surface is parameterized by the spectral parameter z. But when we write the Wilson operator, we only have a partial gauge field or connection. We have a dx term, and we have a dy term, and we have a dz bar term, but there's no dz term. And since we only have a partial connection, we would not know how to do parallel transport in the z direction. And not knowing how to do parallel transport in the z direction tells us that the only allowed Wilson lines live at a definite value of z. So we can take L 
to be any, a loop that lies in sigma, but it has to lie at a particular value of z inside c. So whenever we draw a, a line, or a Wilson line, it's labeled by a particular value of the spectral parameter, which if you remember what we, the very beginning of the lecture is precisely what we had in relativistic integrable scattering, because z then was a real variable and was interpreted as the rapidity, and each particle was labeled by a rapidity. So now what I've told you is why each line is labeled by a definite rapidity. We're only allowed to draw Wilson lines at a particular <coughs> value of z. So that's what we want for Yang-Baxter. Z is the spectral parameter at which a given knot lives, and each line in one of our pictures is living at a particular constant value of z. So, okay. As I said, in integrable systems theory, the spectral parameter is usually a complex variable, although it was a real parameter at the beginning of the lecture. Now let's consider uh, the two-dimensional picture that leads to the Yang-Baxter equation. So we have three lines, which I'm just drawing in the two-dimensional topological plane, which I've called sigma. In the two dimensions where we have diffeomorphism symmetry, we have three lines. And although I'm not drawing it, there are two more dimensions where the lines live, which is the curves, complex Riemann surface C parameterized by the spectral parameter. And our lines live at three different values of the spectral parameter, Z1, Z2, and Z3. All that's important about them is that they're different. Two-dimensional diffeomorphism symmetry means we're free to move the lines around as long as we don't change the topology of the configuration. So we can move the middle line to the left and right, but from a two-dimensional point of view, we can't bring it across the point where it would meet these two lines. So from a purely two-dimensional point of view, we can't prove that this is equivalent to this because when we try to move the middle line left and right, we create a singularity if it tries to intersect the other two. But assuming Z1, Z2, and Z3 are all distinct, it's manifest there's no discontinuity when we move the middle line from left to right, even when we do cross between the two pictures. There's no discontinuity because two lines are not intersecting in four dimensions, and therefore there's no real singularity. So the Yang-Baxter equation will follow from two facts. Two-dimensional diffeomorphism symmetry means that we're free to move the middle line left and right except possibly for a discontinuity when it crosses the middle. And the four-dimensional picture says there's no room for discontinuity. So the two facts imply that the two pictures are equivalent. So two configurations of Wilson operators that differ by what you might call a Yang-Baxter move are equivalent. And similarly, in the configuration associated to integrable lattice spin systems, you can move the horizontal lines up and down at will for similar reasons. When they cross each other in the two-dimensional picture, they're not really crossing in four dimensions. They're not really intersecting each other in four dimensions because they live at different values of disease. But why is there, as elementary a picture, as in the lattice spin systems, where you can evaluate the path integral by labeling each line by a basis vector and each crossing by a local factor. Normally, in quantum field theory, there's nothing nearly as simple as that. Normally, everything interacts with everything. You don't get interactions conveniently localized here, there, here, and there at crossing points. So in the lattice integral system, there's an interaction here and here and here and here. Particles only interact conveniently when they cross at, ver at vertices of the two-dimensional picture. Why would we get something as simple as that? Field theory definitely does not generically lead to something as simple as that. Well, first of all, this is not automatically true. It's true in a situation where the solution of the classical equations of motion is unique. That is, where there are no moduli, to use the jargon. Otherwise, you've got something more elaborate, the modified Yang-Baxter equation of Felder and others. However, in each of the th three cases that are supposed to lead to conventional Yang-Baxter, it's possible to arrange so that there are no moduli. You can read about all the details in my paper with Costello and Yamazaki, uh, 
But uh, the simplest case is the rational case where the Riemann surface is just the complex plane. In that case, you just ask that the gauge field goes to zero at infinity. And likewise, in quantizing, you only divide by gauge transformations that go to one at infinity, or the generator of the gauge transformation goes to zero at infinity. And so if you impose that condition, then the classical solution is unique and has no unbroken gauge symmetries. And perturbation theory is straightforward. And there's a simple argument I'll give in a, a moment for why the usual complexities of quantum field theory collapse to the simple picture of the integrable lattice model. Before I do that, though, I want to say one important fact. Remember at the beginning, I wrote down an example of a rational solution of Yang-Baxter, and it had G as a global symmetry group. The reason that happens is that after dividing by gauge transformations that are one at infinity, you can, can still consider what you might call outer automorphisms, gauge transformations where G is constant at infinity rather than being one. And they act as global symmetries. So you look at G, the finite dimensional underlying gauge group, but the underlying gauge group that you started, group that you started with in constructing a gauge theory, G will act, so SU2 or whatever will act as a group of global symmetries on everything you construct, including the R matrix. So it turns out for the other choices of the, the spectral parameter, for the elliptic and trigonometric cases, you can still arrange that there's a unique solution of the classical equations, but it does not have G as a group of, sim of global symmetries. So you get an explanation of why only the rational solutions of Yang-Baxter have G as a symmetry group, even, but you also understand why they're all related to G. They all come from the gauge theory with G as the gauge group. Okay, anyway, I want to go back to explaining why the complexities of quantum field theory will vanish in a puff of smoke and we'll get the simple picture of the integral lattice model with simple force spin interactions at vertices. That's going to happen because the theory is infrared trivial, which is the flip side of the fact that it's unnormalizable by power counting. So this theory is something like general relativity in that there's a problem in the ultraviolet that Costello solved that problem in his first paper. And there's no problem in the infrared. The interactions are infrared free, just like gravity is weak, very weak force at long distances. That means that effects at long distances in the topological space are negligible. But I put the phrase long distances in quotes because two-dimensional diffeomorphism symmetry means that there's no notion of distance in the topological space. So what am I talking about when I say that effects at long distances are negligible? Well, when we interpret it properly, it will explain why we reduce to a local picture. So we did use, even though the underlying theory had no metric tensor, we did use a metric when we constructed the propagator. And well, I wrote down the propagator without carefully explaining it, it came from this metric. But I could have equally well used a different metric, like this one, with some very large real constant b. So when you look at this picture, which remember is a picture in the two-dimensional topological space, which really has diffeomorphism symmetry, you can consider the vertical lines and also the horizontal lines to be very far apart compared to the differences between the spectral parameters. In such a situation, in an infrared free theory, effects that involve gauge boson exchange between two non-intersecting lines are negligible. So for example, in the configuration of Wilson lines related to the integral system, you don't have to worry about this Feynman diagram with the gluon exchange from here to here. We can make its effects arbitrarily small by taking B to be very large. Now, I should say, the theory is gauge invariant. So the sum of all Feynman diagrams will give the same answer, no matter what B is. But if B is small, that'll be a complicated calculation. We make a convenient gauge choice with large V to simplify it. And part of the simplification is that we can ignore this diagram. Well, we should worry about gauge 
boson exchange from one line to itself. Because if A and B are the positions along the Wilson line at which the gluon is emitted and absorbed, uh, A and B doesn't have to be large. And therefore, this effect won't go away for the similar reason to before. Such effects roughly correspond to mass renormalization in standard quantum field theory. But in the present theory for a straight Wilson line, like the ones in the integral lattice systems, the symmetries do not allow any interesting effect analogous to mass renormalization. So, well, actually, if you literally write down this diagram for a straight line, you'll discover that it's zero. But you'd have to look at the propagator we had about 15 minutes ago, and you'll find that that diagram is literally zero for a straight Wilson line. But more generally, that's a special case of the fact that the symmetries don't allow anything to happen for a straight Wilson line. So diagrams like this are not zero because the theory is infrared free, but they're zero because there's nothing for it to do, analogous to mass renormalization. Now here's a typical Feynman diagram we can't ignore. So A and B could be close to the crossing point and therefore close to each other. And in particular, they're not especially far apart if we make capital B bigger in the gauge choice, that just means that little a and little b will move closer to the crossing point. But it will not get rid of this diagram. This diagram will give an integral over little a and little b that converges, and it will receive con significant contributions from the region where the distances are not much bigger than the differences of the spectral parameters, z and z prime of these two lines. And this diagram will give something non-trivial that we can't further simplify by changing the gauge. I'll say what it converges to in a moment. Now, when we study a general configuration like the one related to the lattice integral models, so here I've drawn a complicated Feynman diagram. Two gluons are exchanged here, three are exchanged here, and about one, two, three, about six are exchanged here. And I've included some bulk vertices. But you see, there are complicated interactions that are possible near each crossing point. Because I can draw a very complicated picture here, but all these vertices, no matter how complicated the picture is, could be close to the crossing point. And therefore, scaling up the metric doesn't simplify it. But anything with the gluon exchange between here and here would be simplified and eliminated, in fact, when we scale up the distances. So we can get complicated interactions near crossing points. But whatever happens near one crossing point is decoupled from whatever ha happens near another crossing point. So that's precisely the picture of the integral lattice models. The local interactions near a crossing point build up an R matrix, it's called, but some kind of four spin interaction. And the overall path integral is computed by summing over all basis vectors propagating between the crossings and including at each crossing a factor of the local R matrix, which simply comes from the sum of all Feynman diagrams supported near a given crossing. As I said, the diagrams near a crossing point simply build up a universal R matrix associated to that crossing. And the discussion makes it obvious that the Yang-Baxter equation is satisfied. And it also hopefully makes clear that for this configuration of Wilson lines, we can evaluate the expectation value of that product of Wilson lines by the standard rules of the integral, lattice integral systems. But why is the R matrix attained this way, the standard rational solution of Yang-Baxter? Or in one of the other cases, the standard trigonometric or elliptic solution? Well, the lowest order non-trivial contribution to the R matrix comes from this diagram I already drew. And I explained why it was non-trivial. You can easily evaluate the integral, and you get an answer which is, in fact, the standard answer for the lowest order non-trivial contribution to the R matrix in the standard rational solution of Yang-Baxter. And once the first order deformation is known, the whole story follows from general arguments. So in a recent paper, Costello, Yamazaki, and I extended this example to show how many important properties of integral models that we won't really have time to explain right now follow from the four-dimensional gauge theory. So in conclusion, I've tried to explain a new perspective on the origin of integral models 
of two-dimensional statistical mechanics and many-body physics. From this perspective, integrability is a simple consequence of the four-dimensional starting point. The Yang-Baxter equation holds because the lines in question are not really meeting in four dimensions. And maybe I'll just remark that 30 years ago, Michael Atia actually had the vision that something like this ought to be the explanation of Yang-Baxter. And my assessment is that Costello finally found it. Thank you. <laughs>